Hi, I'm Bob Alsop with Shop Saver CNC. Around here they call me Router Bob. I have a great video for you. We're going to accomplish two things. One, we're going to create a real world part that's got machining on both sides. And I'm going to show you how you produce this on a production basis on a Shop Saber CNC router. I'm really excited about this. Let's get started. The machine we're using is a ShopSaber IS series CNC router in the 4x8 configuration. These machines are part of the machine tool grade CNC routers at ShopSaber, and here's what that means. It means that the base frame is a one-piece structure that's all welded structural steel. It's machined in a single setup on an aerospace mill. The machines also have precision ball screws and X, Y, and Z axis, and feature precision contour guide rails, and we also include our Super Z tool plate technology in these machines. I want to showcase a few of the options we put on this machine for this application. First off, we're going to hold the parts with vacuum, and they're going to be on a fixture board. So the, I'm going to need a vacuum table, and I chose the phenolic table because it's very durable and it's easy to slide the fixture board on and off the table. We also added a Becker vacuum pump because it has a higher pressure level and that holds the parts much better. Now, uh, locating the fixture board on the table consistently and repeatedly is very, very important, so that's why I put the part locator pin option on there. So all I have to do is raise the pin, slide the board over, and everything's lined perfectly. And finally, I put the T-slot feature on there because that lets me clamp that board in place. This application actually requires five separate tools, so it was a no-brainer to go with an HSD ATC spindle. And it actually has a 10 position tool changer on it. You know, I don't like to clean the machines up, so I put the dust dock on here because it really cuts the cleanup time down. What makes all this work is actually the ShopSaber CNC machine controller. We designed it to be easy to learn and easy to operate. In fact, most of our customers with no CNC experience make their first part within a couple hours of having the machine installed. Now, let's go take a look at the software. In this video, I really wanted to accomplish a couple of things. One, I wanted to make a real world part out of a plastic material that was complicated that had machining on both sides, so we have to figure that part out. And I actually wanted to address making it on a production basis on one of our IS408 CNC routers at ShopSaber. This is our part. It's called a marine adapter plate, and let me give you the background. Several years ago, fishermen used electric trolling motors on their boats, and early on they operated the trolling motors with their foot. So they basically had a rocker pedal and that steered the trolling motor, and that allowed them to fish hands free. So they had both their hands on the rod and reel. And that worked for a long time, and people basically mounted the trolling motors on the front of the boat. They drilled holes into the front of the boat. Everything worked fine. Well, as technology developed, all of a sudden we started tying trolling motors into satellites. And now, all of a sudden, the trolling motors had the ability to drive themselves. The problem was they didn't mount in the same holes. Now, you take a typical fisherman that spent $50,000 or more on his boat, he doesn't want to drill more holes, so we made a marine adapter plate that would allow us to do that. And that's what this is. Basically, the holes here that are countersunk bolt into the boat itself, and then the actual, uh, these holes over here and the things that go with those actually bolt the new trolling motor on. So this enabled them to actually go to the new trolling motor system without drilling more holes in the boat. All right, here's our actual part model, and, and I'm actually using Rhino for the, for the Mac. Let's take a closer look at this. Now the material we're using is one inch thick starboard. Starboard is actually polyethylene, a high density, and it has uh, some UV inhibitors, so it works real well in the sunshine. And, and this material is fairly light, but it's real stiff, so it's a perfect material to make boat parts out of. So basically here's what we've got. We've got machining on both sides. Now this, it, in actuality, is a top, and th here's one, two, three, four holes that are actually bored, and then they're countersunk. That actually bolts this onto the existing holes in the boat, and then these six holes here are actually used uh, to mount the new trolling motor. And let's take a look at the underside, and what we've done on the underside of those is we've actually come in here, and we've counterboard, and then we've counterboard in here a little bit, and a T-net's gonna be there. So when that's all assembled, we'll actually be able to set the trolling motor on there and bolt it down from the top. And that's all that's going to be required. So our challenge is how in the world do we make that? You know, how do we make this part? Now let's take a look at how we would actually set this up on the machine itself. Here's what's on the table. 
This black surface or gray surface, it represents the table surface on the machine. And then these are the part locator pins. And these are very important because this is one of the keys to being able to switch this over very quickly. We basically put this, what's called a fixture board, on the machine, line it up with the pins and turn the vacuum on and that holds it down in place. And then something that you don't see on here, our machine also has T-slots over here. So we'll actually put some mechanical clamps on here. So even if we turn the vacuum off or lower the pins, the fixture board doesn't change. This is really, really important because remember one of the things we want to do is to be able to set the machine up, run it, and not spend a lot of time getting things lined up. So the key to that is are these pins. So that's what we do with that. Now let's take a look at what we had to do to turn this fixture board into a dedicated vacuum fixture. First off, let's take our part and hide it. And you'll see some machining down here. Well, there's a couple things. One, First off, let's go back to a shaded view, and you'll see there's actually a groove cut around here, and it's about 30,000 steep. The purpose for that is to show me where to put the blank, so I know that when I lay the blank on this fixture board, as long as I have material sticking outside of that, I know it's positioned correctly. We'll go back to shading, rendering. Okay, now you'll see these areas here that are black. Well, that's actually a gasket, and what happens is I have a groove cut down in there about 3 16 deep, and uh, that gasket is a, is a rubber closed cell gasket and it's about a quarter inch tall so it's actually sticking above the surface about a sixteenth. And then these circles here are also gaskets and we have to do that because we have holes coming through that we have to isolate or they'll end up, uh, we'll lose vacuum. And then something else, you'll see these pins. Well, we're machining on both sides and the pins give us the ability to flip the part and locate it correctly. Now there's one other feature on here and that's the vacuum channels themselves. And they're cut about a quarter inch deep and they come inside of the gasket itself. And if you look real closely, you can see there's actually two ports, one here and one down on the other end. Let's see if we can get that over here. Now here's where those actually go all the way through the fixture board and it just happens that they line up with the vacuum grooves on the machine table itself. So vacuum comes through these holes and gets circulated and that's how vacuum fixture actually works. Now we have to figure out how do you tool path this when there's machining on both sides. Well, first thing we have to do is we have to figure out how we're going to flip it. You know, once we, if we drill holes, how are those going to line up? And I decided to use these four holes here. Now on, on the side over here, they're actually countersunk, but on this side they're not. And while we're drilling, we'll also bore those out. So we'll do all our holes first. That lets us flip it. We have something to register against. Now down here, you'll also see we're using T-nuts in here, so there has to be a larger counterbore, and then there's a smaller counterbore inside. So that all gets done here. Uh, then we'll probably uh, rough the outside out. We'll leave it a little fat, probably about 15 thousandths, and we'll take that off later as a finished pass because that gives a really great edge. And then the final operation on that side is the roundover, and I'm actually just going to use a roundover bit that had a bearing on it. I just created a form tool in VCAR Pro and use that. That's a real easy way to do things. All right. Now, that basically takes care of the machining on that side. Let's look at the other side. Okay, now the parts flip. Now, I've really only got three uh, operations that have to be done. For one thing, all the holes are drilled through, but over here, I'm actually going to countersink those four holes, and then, then I need to actually do the uh, roundover all the way around on that surface. Now, once that's done, remember, I'm still 15 thousandths thick here. Then I put a three-flute finisher in there and drew a really finished tool path around there, and that gives you that beautiful edge here. That's really all that's required. Now, let's take a look at VCarve Pro, and I'll show you how I create those tool paths. Okay, this is basically how I have it set up on the machine. This larger rectangle here is the actual fixture board. It measures 48 by 24. It's actually covering that front vacuum zone. Okay, the corner's down here. There's a part locator pin here and a couple down here. So that board slides in against the part locator pins. And I actually cut that exterior of that fixture board so that it's a perfect rectangle because it just makes it easier to be consistent when you set it up. So that's where that is. Now let's take a look at how we actually tool path this. So let's look at our tool paths. First thing I'm going to do are holes. So let's look at let's look at that. We're going to machine those holes, and we're going to machine all of them. And and basically we're actually using uh, not a drill bit. We're going to machine them. So I'm using a quarter inch single O flute, and the bit's actually going to spiral down into the holes. And what makes that happen is it's inside, and then down here on the ramp, we're going to add a ramp that's a spiral, and it actually makes the bit spiral as it goes to depth. It's going to go all the way through the material. And here's a little hint. If you want it to spiral tighter, add passes. 
so basically, uh, you can kind of adjust that. I set four passes because I wanted it to get plenty of time to clean the holes. Uh, it's a great way to machine holes, and they come out really clean. And of course, you can, you can adjust the size of your holes if you want to. So that's the first thing I did. All right, let's close that. Then the next thing I did was with the same bit, I did these C boards, and they're hard to see, but they're down in here. A T nut, actually, the holes are quarter inch in diameter, but the T nut uh, actually requires a pocket in there, a hole about 5 sixteenths. So I took that same bit, did the same thing. So what that did was it actually just produced that clearance. And then the final thing, I switched back to a different bit, and actually, uh, this one I used a 3 8 two flute, but it's an O flute and actually machined those out. Those became the pockets, and then I took that same bit and rough cut the outside. And you can kind of see where that is. Now, I'm gonna show you a little trick here. I don't want a whole bunch of different pieces of geometry, so what I ended up doing, I said, okay, on this rough outline, I actually want it to be oversized, and let me show you how you do that. You open this up, whoops, and you see this allowance right here? A positive value makes the part bigger, a negative value makes it smaller. And I said, well, when I cut that out, I want to really leave 15 thousandths because I'm going to remove that later with that finishing tool on the other side. So that's how I leave that amount of material. We're using the same geometry. And I did it in multiple passes. One of the things that's really neat about this material is it forms just beautiful chips. And, and one of the ways you can tell that you're cutting correctly in plastic is the chips are little pieces of plastic. They look like little tubes and they're just beautiful coming off the machine. Then the final thing I'm gonna do is round over the outside edge. And I'll show you how I did that. That was a little bit different also. So let's open that up. I went over here and I created actually a round over bit. So I took a rounder bit that I bought that had a bearing on it and then uh, took the bearing off, took the measurements, and I just drew this as a form tool. And that allowed me to use a simple tool that was available. And I did it in a couple passes. I wanted a rough and finish pass. Now let's go back and let's simulate that. We'll go to simulation. We'll turn this off. We'll go to simulation. And we'll see what's going to happen first. The holes are going to get cut. And then, then the small counterboards. And then the larger counterboards. We've changed tools. Okay. And then we rough the outside. Now there's our part. Remember, it's 15 thousandths oversized. And then we put the round over on it. So that's how we made the first side of that part. OK, now here's the second setup. And this is the other side of the part. And basically, all these holes are drilled here. They were drilled all the way through. So I've got to do a couple things. One, I need to do uh, counter sinks here in these four holes and I need to round this over and do the finish pass on the outside. Before we get too far into this, let me show you something. One of the things um, I wanted to do is, is when I had to counterboard, let me show you how to determine that. Okay, I made a drawing. Made this drawing right here. Okay, now here's what this is. Okay, I wanted the width of the countersink to be a, about a half inch. That fit the screws we had. And, but I didn't want to cut with the tip of the tool because th those V bits don't turn very fast at the end. So I really wanted to cut up on the side of the tool, and so that means I had to be moved over a little bit and down. And so how do you determine that? Well, first off, a countersink's uh, 82 degrees. Well, 90 degrees is going to be close enough, all right? So I said, I'll use a 90 degree bit, and then I decided that, uh, I said, okay, well, if I offset this a 16th, that'll get that down. So I really, what I, I decided to go ahead and create another circle. So I got this measurement, which happened to be an eighth of an inch, and I went to these these holes and I added an eight inch circle in the center. Okay, so that's how that's why I did that. Okay, the other thing I need to know is how deep is that hole. So here's how I determined it. All right, it's going to be from this surface to this point down here. So that tells me how deep it is. So that hole then, uh, uh, that's where the measurement came from. And now let's look at it. So if we open that up, let's go to this. We'll open that up. Okay, so basically on that circle, I'm cutting on the center and I'm cutting 0 0.1875 because that was my measurement. That's how I did the countersinks. They come out perfect if you do it that way. And so let's, that took care of our countersinks. And we'll run simulation in a minute. So that took care of that. Then the next thing I needed to do was a round over. Right, once again, we did it exactly like we did before. That came out really nice. So once that's done, basically all I have left is the final pass. And remember, when I cut it on the other side, when I roughed it out, I left about 15 thousandths. All right, now what I need to do now is cut that off, and that's why I'm using this finish pass. 
and I used a special Vortex tool for that. It's a three flute, half inch finisher. It's four plastic and it has a gentle upsweep and it just does a magnificent job on these materials and it makes beautiful little tiny chips that look like hairs. And, and so that's what I ended up doing. Now let me, let me show you. In this case, I, I, I made it in a single pass so that when it went around the tool, it basically just did a beautiful pass there. All right, and now let's go back through here and we'll actually do our simulation. So here's what actually happened. Um, there's our countersink, there's our round over, and then there's our finish pass. And when you get down, there's your finished part. And remember these holes, the through holes are already there. They don't just show up on here. So basically that's how, how, how I did all the tool pathing. Now let's go out in the shop and let's actually run this on the machine. Our marine adapter plate came out really nice. You can certainly see the power of ball screw technology when you look at these edges. You know, something that's neat too when you cut plastic are the chips. I actually left the dust collector off so you could see it cut. And when you look at the chips on those rough passes, they're little tubes of plastic. And that final finish pass, they're just like little fibers and they're 15 thousandths thick. It does a magnificent job. Well, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you'd like to see more videos like this, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you have more questions, you can contact us at shopsaver.com. Thank you for watching.